This presentation is a very basic introduction to keeping honeybees. If you wish to learn more, consider contacting the Beekeeping Association in your area and attending several of their meetings. The best time to start beekeeping is in April or May, depending on whether you live in the southern, central, or northern part of Illinois. By going to one or more meetings this fall or winter, you will be in much better position to begin this coming spring. Honeybees are the primary pollinators for horticultural crops. If you're growing a few fruit trees such as apples and peaches, small fruits are members of the squash family, and have not seen many bees visiting the flowers, you most likely will need honeybees if you expand your area of these crops to one half acre or more. This assumes you do not have an acre or more of uncultivated land adjacent to your property that is not heavily wooded. Most native bees need areas that are grassland or woodland with a mix of native plants as well as barriers for ground nesting species, such as those that pollinate squash and cucumbers. The advantages of honey, honeybees, well there's a lot of information uh, about their management and their biology. There are 22 beekeeping associations in Illinois where you can receive assistance and mentoring. Uh, there's a list of local beekeeping associations at the Illinois State Beekeeping Association website which will be listed on a later slide. And if you're, uh, you have other livestock on your property, bees can, they are compatible with poultry. They can be kept in the same yard, not a small yard, but a reasonably large yard. And uh, they need to be fenced off from larger livestock such as pigs, goats, cattle, and especially horses. What about native species, such as the blue orchard bee? This bee actually has more diseases than honeybees and requires specialized management. A great deal is yet unknown about native bees, of which there are thousands of species across the country. Few beekeepers have experience with native bees, so unlike raising honeybees, you are far less likely to encounter someone who lives less than one to three hours distant who can help you with native bees. Bumblebee hives can be also be purchased. However, these colonies only last about eight to ten weeks, and they're also implicated in spreading diseases to our native bumblebees. If you produce apples, peaches, cherries, and do not plan to raise fruits or vegetables such as melons, cukes, or pumpkins, bumblebee colonies may make sense for you. Uh, you will have to, after a period of about eight weeks, you will have to purchase uh, an, uh, more bumblebee hives for summer pollination and for the following year. Bumblebees also work well in greenhouses where honeybees do not do well. They wish to fly to the glass and try to leave. You all already may have feral or domestic honeybee colonies nearby. If you see honeybees on flowers on your property or nearby, that is most likely the case. Honeybees will fly more than two miles to visit attractive nectar sources when there are few such sources closer by or the flowering plants nearer to the colony produce less nectar or nectar that is lower in sugar. Less attractive crops such as cucumbers may be visited only if they are close by, perhaps as close as 100 feet or so, and if there is a lack of attractive flowers in the area. In many cases, your choices are to rent colonies or to manage your own. The subject of renting honeybee colonies was covered in a previous presentation. This presentation will focus on very basic considerations in acquiring and managing your own colonies. There are a number of good books on beekeeping on the web. There's also bad information on the web. BeeSource is one of the best websites with a number of discussion threads. There's also a good deal of misinformation, as I mentioned, on the web. Beekeeping in the Midwest uh, was a book published in 1976 by the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. It's available free. Refer to the website listed on the last page uh, in order to locate it. It's an excellent resource, however, it's important to note that it's also outdated with respect to recommendations regarding preventive use of antibiotics. In addition, several pests of honeybees are not covered because they showed up in this country a number of years after the book's publication. 
What are some of the advantages of your own honeybee colonies, of having your own colonies? You won't have to try to locate colonies to rent. Sometimes that's a bit of a hassle. You can co control the timing of bringing in the colonies to your crops. You can sell honey along with your own fruits and vegetables. Adding locally produced honey can attract new customers to your farm stand or farm market um, stand. When starting out with a package or, or a swarm on comb foundation, it's not that common to harvest honey in your first year. By the second year, one can reasonably expect to harvest anywhere from 30 to over 100 pounds of liquid honey per colony. Apiary sites surrounded largely by row crops will offer little early forage for bees, which then will not be able to increase their populations in order to take advantage of later spring sources, such as black locusts or bramble species. What are some of the potential disadvantages of having your own honeybee colonies? Well, you will have initial expenses somewhere around $350 for the first hive, somewhat less for additional ones. You will need to learn new management skills. And of course, getting stung is a major disadvantage for some people, and we'll cover this, that topic a little bit later in this presentation. Another disadvantage is that colonies can and do die uh, during the winter particularly at times and they need replacement which will cost you somewhere between a hundred I mean eighty to a hundred dollars per colony for a package to replace your dead bees. However there are other options one can divide uh, another colony if you have one that's populous and sometimes you can find swarms or do cutouts from buildings and trees. Dividing colonies correctly takes some experience a good example of where mentoring pays off. Uh, you can also uh, put your name on a swarm list either at the U of I Extension Office in your area and also fire departments often keep swarm lists. Sometimes um, these swarms end up being either yellow jacket or wasp nests. Learning how to do a cutout is best done by helping someone who has sufficient experience. What are some other cost-saving measures? Well, you can uh, now and then find colonies for considerably less than $200 or $300 each, excuse me. However, you need to make sure they have been inspected and are healthy. Uh, visit the website for the Illinois Department of Agriculture Bees and Apiary Program to learn more about this. Never buy used, empty hives, etc. Deadly disease spores can persist in them in years. You can make your own hives also, but it's usually not cost effective. Uh, when buying colonies of bees, ask the seller for a certificate that the colony or colonies you're buying have been inspected within the previous few months by an uh, apiary inspector from the Department of Agriculture. It's generally better to buy colonies in the spring or summer than in fall, especially for beginners. This is another example where having an experienced beekeeper along would be helpful. The inspection only certifies that a colony is free of specific diseases. It does not certify, for example, that it is a populous colony worth the asking price. What are some more cost and grief saving measures? Well, I can't emphasize enough contacting and joining your local beekeeping association as well as the Illinois State Beekeeping Association. Find a mentor. Uh, Stay clear of those who are overly opinionated or need to show you how much they know. The Illinois State Beekeeping Association is the statewide beekeeping organization in Illinois. Each year it holds an annual meeting at the Department of Ag building the state fairgrounds in Springfield. There's also summer meetings that rotate between the three north-south regions of the state. These meetings feature nationally known speakers. Regional and local associations usually meet monthly and often feature speakers or other types of programs. How many colonies should you start with? Well, if possible, it's a good idea to start with two colonies. This allows you to compare them, um, which uh, assists in identifying possible problems, for instance, queen problems. Then two, if you have queen problems, that is a failing queen or one that is died, 
you can partially remedy the situation by moving frames of young larvae from a stronger colony over to the apparently queenless colony. Another possibility, um, apart from buying two colonies, uh, or starting with two colonies, is to buy one colony and team up with another beginner and help each other out by working the colonies together. Uh, this slide shows a diagram of uh, equipment you'll need for a hive. Uh, I think it's pretty clear that you have an outer cover and inner cover. Supers are normally where honey is stored that you can take. A queen excluder is optional. It keeps the queen from moving up into the honey supers. Uh, you, in this climate, we need two deep hive bodies and a bottom board. And then you need to buy deep and medium frames and wax foundation for uh, the brood boxes or the deep boxes and the supers. During the first year, you probably won't need two medium honey supers. Later on, you may need as many as four, although it's a good idea during the first year to have at least one so the queen will have enough room to produce lots of young bees. If the bees run out of room to store honey, they will place the honey in the combs needed by the queen. The result could be a colony that is too small a population for optimal overwintering. And remember, your first year, your goal is not to produce honey, it's to get your bees to a population level they will be successful in surviving the winter. This slide shows a typical deep frame of cap brood. Um, cap brood is composed of cells containing honeybee pupae covered with a thin layer of beeswax which looks light brown in this slide. Notice in the upper corners a kind of translucent uh, cells, that is translucent caps over cells, indicates where honey is stored and the open cells contain nectar. The term brood is used by beekeepers to refer to bee eggs, larvae, as well as pupae or cap brood. It's quite common to see the upper and lower corners of brood frames filled with honey or nectar which is on its way to becoming honey. Here's some additional supplies you need smoker, hive tool, hat and veil, gloves. Um, some bee, a number of beekeepers work bees without gloves, but they have some experience under the, their belt, and they, they're working bees that are fairly gentle in their temperament. A bee suit is not necessary, it, unless you're really afraid of bees, in which case you may wonder whether you want to keep them or not. Bee suits are expensive and hot, and part of beekeeping is becoming comfortable with bees buzzing around your head and your hands. Learn good smoker technique from an experienced beekeeper, even one with only a year or so under his or her belt. One of the advantages of starting with a nuke or a package, which we'll get into in a moment, is that they're not defensive. So how about those bees? Usually beginners start with a package of bees which contains two or three pounds of young bees and a young queen in a small separate cage. In many cases these can be ordered through local beekeeping associations, a service to other members. And the photo you see here is um, a package, two or three pounds. You can see much of the area is screened which keeps them from, gives them enough air to survive during shipment. A number of local associations do order, um, do group orders of package bees, and you can also order these through beekeeping equipment suppliers. This slide shows um, several photos of hiving a uh, package of bees. Package bees are not inclined to sting, although if you squeeze one with your hands, uh, they will sting. Notice that the uh, woman in the pink shirt uh, has gloves on, but her air arms are bare. Uh, they will need to be fed sugar syrup in order to make comb that they base on the wax foundation that you've inserted into the frames. The woman in the white bee jacket in the right hand photo is holding the queen cage. Uh, so the queen is shipped separately and then is released after the package is installed. Another option, in my opinion often a better option, is to buy a nucleus or nuke colony. That's a small colony, usually four or five frames 
with a laying queen and combs with larvae and pupae, as well as ones with honey and pollen. So this is a complete colony because it contains all stages of uh, the bee development as opposed to a package which only contains adults and the queen. Beekeepers in your area may have nukes for sale or you can find a list of those selling queens, excuse me, nukes on the website of the Illinois Queen Initiative. Nukes are bee colonies and they have brood and therefore they need to be inspected by a Department of Ag apiary inspector before being offered for sale. They cost around 125 to 140 each and will almost always grow much more rapidly than a package. A package will actually lose population for a while before it begins to grow. In addition, nukes typically have fewer queen problems. Unfortunately, they're often in short supply. Okay, here's a little bit about the inhabitants of the colony, the bees. Uh, colonies, honeybee colonies, full-size ones, consist of up to 60,000 female worker bees. Oh, that's pretty exceptional. During the growing season, there'll be hundreds of drones or male bees, and there'll be normally one queen, the mother of all the bees in the colony. In the photo on the right, you see the queen with the numbered disc on her back, a drone is in the middle, and a worker is on the right. See if you can locate another drone. The queen is marked with a numbered disc glued onto her thorax for identification purposes. Notice that the queen has a much longer abdomen than the workers or drones. A drone's larger thorax contains more powerful flight muscles and larger eyes, the better to see and pursue the queen in flight 100 feet or so in the air. Typically, an unmated queen will mate on the wing with 10 to 20 or more drones. The workers, as the name implies, do all the work in the colony. That is unless, of course, you count laying 1,500 days a day, eggs a day, as a work. Okay, what about stinging? Well, first of all, a few tips about avoiding being stung. Wear protective clothing. Use a smoker, keep it lit. Only open hives during warmer weather when possible, 75 to 95 degrees. Uh, if you're just going to glance at the top to see if the bees are alive, uh, 55 to 65 is okay. Uh, use slow movements, no jerking or slapping bees, and keep bees of gentle stock. If you are stung, scrape the sting out promptly with your fingernail or the hive tool or whatever you need. The longer the sting stays in there, the more uh, significant will be your response. A lot of avoiding being stung when opening a bee hive is using common sense. Uh, some beekeepers do not use a smoker. Uh, however, it's thought to mask, the smoke that is, is thought to mask the alarm pheromone, which is released when a colony is manipulated. Another important thing is don't stand in front of the hive, don't stand in the bees' line of flight. Bees keep the interior of their cluster at about 93 degrees Fahrenheit. They really don't appreciate it when the cluster is disturbed in cold or even cool weather and will respond accordingly. Trying to work a hive at night is also a very bad idea. Here's a photo of a normal reaction to uh, being stung. You um, experience pain immediately. Later, there's usually itching and redness, some minor swelling. These reactions are normal the first time, few times you get stung. After a few things, these symptoms are uncommon. And getting stung now and then is a part of beekeeping. When I was about 20 years old, I was stung above the right eye. The next morning my eye was swollen shut, but there was little redness or itching. Within 24 to 48 hours the swelling had subsided. In comparison, when working with African bees in Venezuela, I was often stung dozens of times each week, albeit usually through my work shirt or gloves. I had no problems with swelling, itching, or redness. There are a small percentage of people, uh, something like one in a thousand, who have allergic, serious allergic reactions to stings. Uh, 
and some of the symptoms are widespread rapid swelling, itching elsewhere on the body, swelling inside the throat, disorientation, and loss of consciousness. Those who experience these symptoms should seek immediate medical attention regarding widespread itching. Persons who are hyperallergic to bee venom could be stung once on the back, for example, and in five to ten minutes feel itching on the bottom of their feet. In addition, they may feel swelling in their throat and lose consciousness. They should be taken immediately to an emergency room or perhaps if, if you are alone and you experience this, call an ambulance. Persons with these symptoms should not take up beekeeping. As you can see, beekeeping is not for everyone. You will need to make a commitment of time and money and be willing to stung, be stung at times. If after viewing this presentation you're still interested in beekeeping, plan to attend a meeting of your local association. Get to know several beekeepers in your area. Most keep beekeepers are eager to share their knowledge and love of bees. Beekeepers are a pretty unique bunch. You will meet a lot of very helpful individuals at local beekeeping association meetings. Find a mentor, maybe two. Having experienced mentors is one of the best ways to learn how to keep bees. Learn to recognize there is a diversity of views about different management concerns. Which strategy one chooses can depend on concerns about overuse of chemicals versus natural beekeeping, on the type of bees you have, and whether or not producing a large honey crop is your sole objective. There is an old saying that when you have 10 beekeepers in a room, there are at least 11 different ideas about how to keep bees. Here's a few keys to successful beekeeping. In order to understand proper colony management, you need to learn a good deal about honeybee biology and behavior. So beekeeping is applied honeybee biology. Uh, this necessitates reading and doing your own observations and learning from one or more mentors. Many of the beekeeping associations across the state offer classes for beginners. The University of Illinois also offers one at the Urbana-Champaign campus. The website is pictured in this slide. As a beginning beekeeper, you should go into your hives on a frequent basis, perhaps once a week, uh, waiting probably uh, a week to 10 days at least uh, after initially introducing the package and the queen. The major goal of the first year, other than having a thriving hive the following spring, should be to learn as much as you can through hands-on experience. It should not be to make honey the first year, although that does happen fairly frequently depending on your location. In addition, seek out other opportunities for learning by visiting more experienced beekeepers, perhaps offering a system with certain tasks, such as requeening a colony or making or dividing a split. I hope uh, if you continue to be interested, you'll pursue this, and I think you'll find it a very attractive hobby, or in some cases, a uh, profitable supplement to your the rest of your farming. Good luck.